Riverside, California. At three and a quarter miles, it's one of the largest and most impressive road courses in the country, with its famous series of S-turns and a back straightaway that's nearly one mile in length. This course offers a real challenge to the drivers and crews who tackle it. And on a windy day at Riverside, it's a battleground for the fastest GT cars in the world. Hi, I'm Ed Bruce. Today, Brock Yates, Steve Evans, and I are awaiting the start of the sixth annual Los Angeles Grand Prix. You'll be seeing some of the best international teams in the world competing in some of the fastest racing machines in the world, the Grand Touring Prototypes. Another note of special interest is the fact that Southern California is home base for many of these teams, so they'll be pushing a little harder for the checkered flag, because this is the one time during the year when they get a chance to compete in front of the hometown crowd. We're getting ready for the green flag, so let's go to Brock and Steve at the track. Thank you, Ed. It's a very exciting day here at Riverside as on the pole with a new track record over 130 miles an hour is an all-American built endurance prototype car, the Ford Mustang GTP. When Ford decided to get back into prototype endurance racing, the easy and inexpensive thing to do would be to have gone to Europe and selected a proven chassis, a March or a Lola, put one of their big block V8 motors in it, draped a Mustang look-alike body, gone out, maybe won some races and sold some cars. The minute special vehicle operations headed by Michael Cranip has said, no, we have the best talent in the world right here in the U.S., so let's build our own car. They brought in the geniuses from Ford Aerospace who designed a carbon fiber monocoque tub. They selected the production-based 2.1-liter four-cylinder engine, turbocharged, intercooled, and mounted it in the front of the automobile. That left the back available for a huge ground effects tunnel that you could hide a Shetland pony under it. Bobby Rahal, who will start the race report, he's teamed with West German Klaus Ludwig, he is already in the car, going to be impossible for me to talk to him right now. This car has been plagued with minor difficulties. It actually won the first race in which it was, it was entered, and then little things started going wrong. It'll be interesting to see if Ray Hall goes out and paces the car in the early going of the six-hour endurance race. Brock? Thanks, Stephen. On the outside of the front row, the Randy Lanier built Whittington car. Randy, uh, you got a fast car right beside you. You going to try to take the lead early, or are you going to hang back a bit? Uh, we're going to just stay back, play it by ear for about the first hour, see what falls out, and then go ahead and run a little bit harder then. Okay, well, good luck. Thank you very much. Brock, back in row number 11 is Jim Busby, who back in 1981 set the race record which still stands along with John Fitzpatrick and a Porsche. Who better than this man to give us a driver's viewpoint of Riverside Raceway? Right, Steve, and Riverside, of course, is one of the most famous and oldest road racing circuits in the United States, located in the high desert, California, about 60 miles to the east of Los Angeles. 3.25 miles, and that 4,000-foot straightaway, which is still used as a drag strip. As we see Busby getting underway out of the Riverside pits, he'll actually enter the track a little bit beyond turn one in that Lola GTP car of his powered by a Mazda rotary engine and running on street radial tires. Down this short straight toward a very tricky turn two. Turn two is one of those corners that sort of sneaks up on you and all at once it's there. If you miss the entry to turn two, it sets you up wrong for the S's. The S's probably historically is one of the most difficult and dangerous points on the Riverside Raceway. They lead you all the way up. In our car, for example, we're flat in high gear all the way up the S's and then we've got to break down for turn five. Very hard braking here as the cars go up a little knoll and into turn six, a hard right-hander leading onto a short straightaway. This stretch is slightly downhill, leads to a little knoll that makes turn seven blind. Uh, turn seven, again, is one of those corners that'll sneak right up on you. You come very fast up a short shoot out of six, put the brakes on very hard up the hill and have an enormous amount of traction. As you crest the hill, though, you lose that traction begin to turn down to the apex with the tail loose, still trying to add the power to get that good solid shot out onto that short shoot up to eight. There's not much in the way of natural landmarks here along this stretch of Riverside, and that can make setting up for the very fast right-hander called turn eight mighty tricky. All of the speed that you carry out of turn eight will be added to your top speed at the end of the straight. It's important that you get in early, turn it, make a late apex, and be on your way through the second half to pick that speed up. Here's where they really fly at Riverside. 4,000 feet of slightly downhill straightaway. The cars can run nearly 200 miles an hour under that bridge before they begin to set up for that slight little left-hander leading in to turn nine. Turn nine is one of those corners that as you approach it, uh, looks like it's banked enough to carry you no matter what you do. Uh, 
Uh, however, once you get the car turned in, you find that there's a traction spot and a loose spot. You stay down low into the traction spot because, again, you need that speed coming off the corner to carry you down the front straight and back to the start-finish line. So, 3.25 miles of some of the most interesting roadway in the United States. Well, they certainly mastered this track in qualifying, Brock. Three track records in the GTP class, the Ford Mustang GTP, and GTO. It was a Camaro of Gene Felton and Billy Hagen with a record at 111 miles an hour. And the GTU class, Elliott Forbes Robinson and John Snyder in a Porsche 924 Turbo, also a new track record. The classes all run together but are scored separately, and there's three championships to be won at the end of the season. You know, Steve, traditionally this kind of racing is dominated by European-made automobiles, but here at Riverside, we got some good old American iron up front. As you said earlier, the Mustang built in Detroit is on the pole, and beside it, that March car, of course, built in England, is powered by a 355 cubic inch Chevrolet engine, naturally aspirated. We've got a lot of turbocharged cars. We said earlier that's the Busby car with the little Mazda rotary engine in it, but a variety of power plants and a variety of automobiles make this kind of racing particularly interesting. Also interesting, Brock, from a driver's standpoint, considering that the GTP cars can hit near 200 miles an hour down the back straight, maybe the GTU cars 140, 150, uh, you've got an awful lot of passing going on throughout the race, and you're in traffic very early. Sure are, Steve. As we see the two lead cars warming up their tires, the field is going to make one pace lap and then do a flying start. Remember in the old days, they used to do an endurance racing like this, what was called a Le Mans strat. They'd line the cars up on one side of the track. Everybody would run across the track, jump in the car, start the cars, and off they go. But not now. They're going to start them on a flying start after this pace lap is completed. Incredible variety here, Brock. Back in the second row, debuting is the brand new 962 Porsche, the prototype of which was so successful this year at Daytona with Mario Andretti. Uh, you've got the little 924 Turbo. You've got a Pontiac Fiero back there in the GTU class, another factory effort. Uh, really a dazzling array of state-of-the-art automobiles. They sure are, Steve, but let's not forget that they are theoretically road cars. Uh, each one of these automobiles, even that Mustang you see up front, has essentially two seats inside, although you wouldn't have any room for a rider, but they theoretically carry full road equipment, lights, tail lights, uh, windows, windshield, windshield wipers, the whole thing that, that makes them almost road worthy. Of course, they're race cars in the purest sense, but theoretically, they're like the cars you drive on the street. A lot of world-class drivers in this race, many of whom will see action in Europe this year, particularly Jim Busby. In fact, there are two Mazda Lolas, just like the one he's in today, in Europe now. They're leading their class in world endurance competition. Here, with the IMSA classifications, they give away about 500 horsepower to some of the other cars, so he's really going to need that endurance edge. In just a few moments, the Los Angeles Grand Prix will get underway. This special presentation of American Sports Cavalcade is being brought to you by BF Goodrich, makers of TA high-tech radials, and by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? We're moments away from the start here at Riverside as Randy Lanier and Bobby Rahal lead the field around that sweeping turn nine and down toward what may be a green flag, Steve. As long as these races are, Brock, anything close to an organized grid will usually bring out the green flag. Starter looking them over, and indeed we have a start to the Los Angeles Grand Prix. Bobby Rahal in the Ford Mustang up to the S's and into the lead. Well, he pulled Lanier coming off the line. As Lanier said earlier, he may be just going to sit back and let Bobby Rahal uh, set the pace for a while in that very quick Mustang. Already one driver having problems, Brock. That is number 11, the white Chevy Lola of Chuck Kendall, trying to get it back on the racetrack, and indeed he will. Well, one of the nice things about the S's at Riverside, Steve, is there's plenty of room to get off into the dirt without hurting yourself. So he's back in the race as we see Ray Hall in that beautiful blue and white Mustang angle down through turn seven. Now in comes the turbo and he pulls out a big leap. But look at this. Into second place comes the brand new Porsche 962 of Al Holbert. He started in third place, was thought to be a real contender and it looks like he's gonna show some strength early in the going. And Hurley Haywood in the red March car number two has now moved into third spot. And Randy Lanier who started in the front row is now back to fourth. So as Ray Hall leads him out onto the long back straight, we've got that Porsche 962 
that'll try to challenge him. That's a brand new automobile, Steve, just come to the United States. It's a derivative of the old 956 that dominated European racing last year, but was not eligible for racing in the United States. Ray Hall, down into turn nine. Look at that turbo pump out some extra fuel through the exhaust pipe. Bobby Ray Hall won his last appearance here at Riverside in an Indianapolis car on the kart circuit last fall. The Mustang had everybody buzzing during qualifying. With that front engine design, the huge ground effects tunnel, this car seems to stick like no other. It's interesting, Steve, that Ford chose to do a front engine version of this race car as opposed to most of the other automobiles in the GTP class or mid-engine. But they said, okay, this is supposed to be a Mustang. A Mustang is a front engine car in reality, so we're going to make this one a front engine car. A lot of space age materials in it, though, as you said, and not a whole lot of resemblance to the Mustang you're going to find in your neighbor's driveway. With the exception of that four-cylinder cast iron production block, Bobby Rahal certainly needs no introduction to American fans, and equally as famous in Europe is the West German Klaus Ludwig. So they've got quite a dynamic duo. They sure do. They're very quick drivers. Ludwig, very experienced in cars of this type and racing in the German sedan series for a long time. Before he came over here, he was really the first guy to run a car of this type for Ford. But now, of course, Ray Hall teaming up with him in these endurance races. This automobile won one last year at Elkhart Lake. It has been consistently the quickest qualifier, but they've had some problems with its long-range reliability. But today could be the day they put all those troubles behind him. In his mirrors, Ray Hall sees that 962 Porsche driven by Al Holbert, the defending IMSA GTP champion. But with all the victories, Holbert has never won a racer at Riverside. But right now, he's starting to move in a little bit on Ray Hall, who still holds the lead in that Mustang. Uh, this is an early part of the race, though, and of course, he, everybody up front is going to feel each other out. We saw earlier Lanier fall back. He obviously can run a lot faster. It may be that Ray Hall will begin to back down a little bit, too, once he's established this kind of supremacy. But what an interesting duo up front. The best America has to offer, and the finest making its debut from Europe, the Porsche. And Al Holbert, a very versatile driver, had a go at, for a couple of years in Grand National Stock Car Racing, did well there, run sports cars very nicely, and just about to embark on a career in Indianapolis-type racing. His teammate, Derek Bell, one of the very best endurance drivers in the world, won Le Mans twice, and is acknowledged to be without real peer in this kind of racing. Well, Al Holbert uh, moving up on the Ford Mustang, uh, proving that, and in the pits already, Brock, is car number 15. That is John Kalasian, a Chevy Lola, who qualified quite high. In fact, uh, was in the fifth row, already down off of the air jacks, going back out. And often, even in the early going, if the driver isn't quite happy with the way the car is handling, you might as well get into the pit area, get it sorted out, and back to being competitive. Right, Steve. Uh, it's a long way to go, and you've got plenty of time. Pit stops are not quite as critical in this type of racing as they may be, for example, in Grand National Stock Car Racing. They take a little bit longer, take a little bit more time to make sure the automobiles are right before they get underway. As we see Ray Hall and Holbert come down the front straightaway, they're beginning to lap some of the slower cars, Steve. Uh, already, these cars are overtaking some of the GTU automobiles you talked about earlier. Much slower automobiles to begin with. And already in the pit area is Hurley Haywood. Haywood, an accomplished road racer. This is the Chevy March, uh, and the crew, I'm sure, not happy with the car coming in this early. Uh, Haywood, also a former Le Mans winner, uh, won at the Daytona 24-hour race repeatedly, a fine driver. He's obviously not happy. Boy, it didn't take Ray Hall uh, and the leaders long to catch some of the back marker GTU cars. They already have their hands full. And the closing rate, Brock, is now so fast that that may be the most demanding part of this kind of racing, is just staying out of trouble. Yeah, the slower cars in this GTU class have a big uh, burden that drivers do because they've got to keep their eyes in the rearview mirror. As uh, Holbert took a move on the outside there, now he's right in behind Ray Hall. By the way, it should be noted that these GTU cars are basically stock-type automobiles with uh, engine displacements under 2.5 liters. Uh, that's the reason for GTU. GTO is engines over 2.5 liters. They're also stock-type automobiles. Nowhere near as modified as these Mustangs and 962 Porsches we see in the lead. There you saw on the left side of your screen one of the flagmen signal some of the slower cars to move over and let the faster drivers through. And those four guys are looking at that passing flag throughout most of this race. 
and they're very gentlemanly about uh, giving the faster cars the line to the turns. Well, sometimes they get in the way. They don't really mean to because they're carrying on a race among themselves, and so they have to race each other, and they also have to race the faster guys. As Hurley Haywood, they've got the hood off the automobile. It looks like they're working with the front suspension on that car. Particularly the steering, Brock. It's rack and pinion steering. It can be adjusted very quickly for toe-in or toe-out, and that appeared to be what the crew was doing. Well, I'm sure Hurley figures they can get it fixed because he hasn't gotten out of the car, so he's ready to go as soon as they get the hood back on. As we see, Holbert and Ray Hall threading their way through slower traffic as they head up that little crest for turn seven. Ray Hall through him, and he's going to try to get by Roger Mandeville in that yellow RX-7. He is one of the quicker cars in the GTO category, but not fast enough to hold off Ray Hall and Holbert. You know, Brock, I'm still interested to see a drag race between these two down that long straightaway, just to, to see the raw horsepower, who has the edge there. What a race that would be, the four-banger of the Mustang versus the flat six of the Porsche. As we see Hurley Haywood, the steering problem is apparently corrected on that number two March Chevy. He gets it underway and speeds out of the pits and back into the race here at Riverside. Al Holbert now is tucking right up behind the Mustang, and here is that drag race. Holbert drafting the GTP Mustang. He moves to the outside and is going to try to get around Ray Hall as they go into nine. And he will get by him. He tried him on the little left-hander, and finally in the right-hander, sweeps underneath Ray Hall and pulls into the lead as they go around that great sweeping right-hander called turn nine at Riverside. And now a new leader here. The number 86, 962 Porsche of Al Holbert, but Bobby Ray Hall isn't giving an inch. Yet you've got to wonder, Steve, I wonder if he gave the lead up and let uh, just to let Holbert set the pace for a little while, or if in fact he got snooker going down in there into turn nine. Well, now Al has to find the holes in the traffic, and Bobby can tag along behind him. I'll tell you one thing. I was looking at that Porsche earlier, and that has the biggest set of brakes I think I've ever seen in any kind of a race car. Look at this, Brock. Cyril Vandermeer from South Africa has slipped the double zero march into the third spot. He sure has, as we see him snake through turn five and up that little hill into turn six, and as he is now beginning to overtake some of the slower GTU traffic. Well, Cyril became a national hero in South Africa after winning the 24-hour race this year in Daytona, and they had retired this car. It was being shipped home as a display car. Their brand-new 84G March was destroyed in a fire testing at Road Atlanta. They had to bring out the old piece, but it's running quite well. You'd never know that Cyril is rather new, really, to road racing, a four-time rally champion in South Africa. Here's a little guy that didn't have to buy a ticket. He just tunneled his way in. We'll be back. Back at Riverside, Al Holbert in the brand new Porsche continues to lead the Los Angeles Grand Prix, followed very closely by the amazing American-built Mustang driven by Bobby Rahal. The South African team, Cyril Vandermeer, is in the third spot. Moving into fourth is Kemper Miller in a march, and, if, and we have got a problem. It is John Bauer, the second quickest of the GTO qualifiers, stranded right in the middle of the racetrack, Brock Yates. He sure is, Steve. He got down into the dirt on the inside, then looped it right in the middle of the racetrack, and you can see a lot of the traffic getting around him. Not much room to maneuver there. That wall's mighty close there in turn nine. Bauer gets back underway. He's currently riding fourth in the GTO category. No doubt, flat spot of the tires, and he's headed for the pits for a tire change, and I'm sure they'll have to look the chassis over, because that was a hard ride that Bauer took. Fortunately, no serious damage done. Uh oh another GTO car in trouble, Brock. This is Billy Hagen, the top qualifier in the GTO division. The car is co-driven by Gene Felton. They have won three out of four races this year, but they may be out of the race. Billy Hagen started in lieu of Felton and is now outside the car inspecting the damage. The rules say in this kind of racing that only the driver can work on a car if it's stranded on the racetrack. As back in the pits, we see John Bauer getting ready to get back underway as they change those tires as we thought. His co-driver, by the way, is the Olympic decathlon champion of a few years back, Bruce Jenner, who's turned into a fine race driver into his own right. And you can bet Jenner is down alongside the wall, hoping that he still gets a chance to participate here today. Al Holbert still in the lead in that beautiful streamlined number 86 Porsche 962. These automobiles are so adept, these Porsche cars, at this kind of racing. They're strong, they're fast, they've been doing it for over 30 years, and they get better and better at it. They're awful tough to beat in the endurance racing, Steve. 
Well, no maker has won more endurance titles in Porsche, that's for sure. And they continue to mount tires on the number 77 Ford Thunderbird of John Bauer and Bruce Jenner. Apparently, all four corners needing attention here. A lengthy stop. Well, based on the luck that some people have had over the years spinning in turn nine, they're lucky they're still in the race at all. And as you pointed out earlier, Brock, pit stops are not quite as important in this kind of racing as they are in, say, NASCAR. But still, these guys are proud of uh, the time it took them to mount those tires. They get it down off the jack and rejoining the race is number 77, John Bauer, who, by the way, won the 81 Trans Am Championship, a car uh, similar to this machine. So Bauer gets back in the race and getting off of the racetrack is Cyril Vandermeer. He was running third in the double zero Porsche March, and he has got a flat right rear tire. So Cyril is going to have to carefully limp this car to the pit area. Not a lot of ground clearance. There could be a few rocks in that infield area. And right now, he has come to a stop. Meanwhile, down in the pit area, Brock Yates is with the uh, crew chief of car number 77, Barry Hartzell. I'm with uh, Barry Hartzell, the crew chief on the bar. Jenner Thunderbird, did, they, did the tire go down or did it go down when he spawned, John? I don't know. We didn't get clear on that, okay? So we just know that he had a flat tire. There's no damage, okay? We changed all the tires, got fuel in it, and we're back on the road. No problems. No suspension damage at all, huh? None that we could see. Okay, thank you, Barry. Okay, so the Jenner Bauer car still in the hunt. Another Porsche is doing well, Brock, in the GTU class. This is Elliott Forbes Robinson, the 924 Turbo Porsche, car number 87. Elliott uh, won the Trans Am Championship sedan racing uh, in 1982, and no stranger to endurance racing either. Nor is he a stranger to the Grand National Stock Car Racing ranks. Elliott ran very well and with the Stockers for a while before he came back to the sports cars and now running, as you said, first in GTU. Well, there's an example, Steve, of how the speed variations in these different classes here at Riverside make the difference. That's Elliott in the back there, but he's just been blown off by that red 935 turbo of Bob Aikens, a much faster automobile, even though Elliott is leading his own class. Aiken, interestingly enough, is running this 935 for the last time. Been around for years, dominated IMSA type racing for many, many seasons, but now its career has ended. I had a chance to talk with Aiken about the end of the 935 before the race. Well, the Porsches, especially the 935s, have really been the mainstay of uh, this kind of racing for a long time. I'm sure there may be a little pang of uh, remorse to see the old girl go into the garage for the last time. Yeah, well, um, you know, I've raced these things now for about six years, just all over the United States and Europe, and there, there is. I. I feel I'm romantically involved with 935s, and, and you know my my car always carries the little uh, word "lady" on the nose. And uh, I'm doing an article uh, on this race entitled "Last Dance with a Lady." <laughs> well, very good. I hope that last dance is a very romantic one. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Looks like it will be, Brock. Even though the old girl is not among the leaders, she just clocked the fastest trap speed down that long straightaway, 187 miles an hour. She's still got a little pizzazz. She sure does, Steve. And of course, these automobiles will steadily be replaced by the 962 type Porsches that Al Holbert is introducing here today. There are going to be a lot more of those. And here comes the number double zero car of Vandermeer. The, this, too, is a Porsche powered automobile, although it's a March chassis. We remember we saw him out at turn nine with a flat right rear tire. They're now in the process of replacing that as the crew chief talks to Vandermeer. They're not going to get him out of the automobile. Uh oh. They've spotted some suspension damage on the right rear corner of that automobile. So, in fact, the car was hurt when it went off the track in turn nine and that tire went flat. That'll cost them some time in the pits. Well, Brock, benefiting from the South Africans' problems is Ken Miller in car number 25, also a march. That has allowed him to move in to the third position. As the race is running along in pretty regular fashion, let's go down and join Ed Bruce in the garage area. Thanks, Steve. Exciting. GCP Racing from Riverside, California. This is John Bishop in the pits here in Riverside. John is the founder of IMSA. John, how are you doing today? We're doing fine today. Did you ever foresee anything like this when you started? Yep, but uh, nobody would believe me. So I'll say, no, we, it just grew beyond our wildest dreams. How, how old is IMSA? 15 years now. International Motorsports Association, Yes, right? sir, yeah. Uh, there was some talk at one time, you know, that it was kind of a, a Porsche parade. Now it's everybody's involved. Well, that's the, that's the key to these uh, GT prototype rules. For many years, not just here, but all over the world, uh, endurance racing, has been a Porsche exercise. And that is not to say anything bad about Porsche. It's simply that it was the kind of uh, rules 
throughout the world that only one manufacturer was willing to invest in to be the best. And Porsche did their homework, and they are the best. But uh, we decided that the public and the other contestants needed to play the game, too. John, it's looking great. It's, it's exciting, and, and they are fast. Right? Well, they're, uh, they're very fast, but under these rules that we have now, anybody can win. Chevrolets have won, Jaguars have won, Porsches have won, and uh, I'll tell you, sooner or later, you're going to see this Ford win and, uh, and some other interesting cars like this Buick Turbo. Well, Steve, the fans love to see all different kinds of automobiles running out here, and they're sure getting that kind of a treat today. That particular march there, Kemper Miller's powered by a Chevy, but we've got some other ones out here, as we said earlier, powered by Porsches, and oh, here is an, a Lola, an older Lola, driven by Jim Mullen with a flat left rear tire, and that thing is flopped around so bad it's torn away a bunch of the bodywork as Jim tries to get it into the pit. And here, Brock, towards the top of our screen, we can see one Porsche driver who's intent on maintaining that dominance, Al Holbert, debuting the latest from Stuttgart. He's got a lot of traffic to contend with. He sure does, Steve, including that other white automobile, which is Jim Busby's Lola Mazda. That's the car that gave us that terrific tour of Riverside earlier in the day. And earlier today, Brock, Jim Busby told me that one of the secrets to this homogenized kind of endurance racing is to not get involved in other people's crashes. <laughs> Isn't that the case? And you can see a lot of them out here, if you, uh, especially when they run at night. These cars oftentimes, in the Le Mans, Sebring, and other races, they go around the clock. And boy, then it really gets wild when the sun goes down. Indeed it does, as Al Holbert leads the Los Angeles Grand Prix. The Eckodrich TA High Tech Radials. Update. For enthusiasts, subject truck performance. Traction. That's what trucks get with the rugged radial mud terrain TA. Durability. On road and off. With the radial all terrain TA. Last season, BF Goodrich took more off road wins. In more classes. More than any other tire company. BF Goodrich TA high tech radials. We make trucks and cars perform. Mustang! Mustang GT. Hard right, bigger front stabilizer bars flatten the curve. Quick left, rear quadrashock suspension holds the line. New control in a car called Mustang GT. Want more? Take the uninhibited Mustang convertible. For the sophisticated technology of Mustang SVO. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Mustang! Have you driven the best built American cars? Have a comment, suggestion, or a question about your favorite Nashville Network shows or stars? If so, you can write us. Care of TNN Information Services, The Nashville Network, 2806 Opryland Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37214. Her streets are paved with memories, her roads are lined with dreams. There's magic in her music. Come see what we mean. Los Angeles Grand Prix at Riverside, California, where this long race is beginning to take its toll. Hi, I'm Brock Yates, along with Steve Evans and Ed Bruce, as we see the Argo of Jim Truman in the pits, apparently out for the day, as Truman, the owner of a large nationwide chain of motels, climbs out of his automobile, shake hands with his pit crew, and probably says goodbye for the day. Well, here's a man who is trying to say goodbye to the rest of the pack. That's the leader, Al Holbert, in the Porsche 962. A very auspicious debut for the new Porsche. Uh, Derek Bell is scheduled to take the wheel of this machine later on in the race. 
tremendous disappointment, I'm sure, for Len St. James as the Arco is in the pitch. The lady driver from Florida was hoping to prove herself at the wheel of a very high-speed race car. Here's a fellow who has proven himself many times, Bobby Rahal, in the second spot, but has fallen back just a few seconds behind the Porsche of Al Holbert. Down in the pit area with the uh, Jim Truman team is Brock Yates to find out what put that car out of action. Jim Truman, who started and ran so well with the red roof in car up out early. What's the problem, Jim? Well, we had a problem with the bumps on our suspension, and it, that was a factor, but eventually I think we got some crud in the fuel system. I had pressure, but I wasn't getting fuel. And when they noticed that the rear wishbone was broke, they decided I shouldn't go back out. A good, wise decision. Maybe it was the good that we lost fuel pressure before you lost the wishbone, right? Yeah, it was. I knew something was wrong, but it was really not too bad. And if something happened in nine, it would have been bad because it was the left rear I knew was was wiggling. So maybe it was good. Well, we're sorry you're out so soon. Thank you. Jim Truman, who with the Lynn St. James car, uh, is out for the afternoon here at Riverside. And that's a short wheelbase car, the Cosworth Argo, that is a rough ride at best. And uh, Mr. Truman certainly making the right decision, not wanting to take it out with any suspension problems whatsoever. And here is Bobby Rahal in the Ford Mustang number seven, currently running second, but Rahal is coming into the pits. Now this probably is a scheduled stop. Let's see if there's a driver change involved here. Klaus Ludwig of Bonn, West Germany, is the team driver along with, and Rahal is coming out of the car. So Klaus Ludwig will be going in, Brock. Indeed he is, and that takes some time, Steve, with these automobiles. Uh, Ray Hall is considerably larger than Ludwig, so there's going to be some adjustments that have to be made uh, to the seat to get uh, Klaus uh, properly positioned, and they raise the hood for a second. So we'll have to find out what uh, is going on there, as well as the rear suspension. They seem to be having a look down there, so it may be that there are some problems with the Mustang. Pretty efficient stop, all things considered. And Kemper Miller uh, will be glad to see the Ray Hall car in the pits because that means he has moved that march into the second spot. So it will be a game of catch-up for this man, Klaus Ludwig, as he leaves the pits in that long nose blue and white Mustang built in the shops of the Ford Motor Company, a mighty proud accomplishment for a factory that has a long racing history as they get underway. And it's going to be Ludwig with his foot hard down to make up the distance be, that he has lost now, both to Hulbert and to Kemper Miller in second place. Well, Brock, over in the big cubic inch GTO division, Walt Boren has moved the number 47 Corvette into the lead, followed by the Montoya M1 BMW, car number 43, and Roger Mandeville, uh, carrying the flag for Mazda, has moved up into third spot. Walt Boren is a very accomplished driver. He's been out of racing for a couple of years, came back, jumped into this Corvette, and is doing a fine job leading the race as he runs through turn nine and back out onto the front straightaway. Good job, Walt Boren, a very steady driver. A lot of skill behind big displacement automobiles like this. And this is Elliott Forbes Robinson in the leading GTU car. The car, of course, that runs in the under 2.5 liter category. Lee Mueller in an RX-7 is second. And Jack Dunham rides in third in another Mazda RX-7. So two Mazdas and a Porsche lead that category. And here is your leader, Elliot Forbes Robinson, as we said. Former champion at Can-Am competition. A great driver all around. Former stock car driver. A man who loves to race. And in fact, his father was a fine racing driver as well. From right here in Southern California, Steve. And with those kind of credentials, uh, Elliot Forbes Robinson is seldom out of work as a professional race car driver. And a guy who is maturing today as a driver is Randy Lanier. He has moved that normally aspirated Chevrolet March into the third spot. Bill Whittington, his co-driver on the wall, has got to be very pleased with this young man's progress. I mean, he owns the car. He can drive it if he wants to. Yeah, but, but uh, Bill Whittington, a member of that famed uh, Fort Lauderdale Whittington Brothers group, are all noted as very, very fast drivers. They also own the Road Atlanta racetrack, but here, Randy, Bill's co-driver, is doing a really good job, Steve. Well, Randy Lanier's Blue Thunder racing team comes in here with a lot of confidence, Brock, because with brother Don Whittington, they won Road Atlanta a few weeks ago, and here is John Morton trying to put yet another lap on the Mazda Lola of Jim Busby. On the inside of turn number nine, Morton tries it. Busby doesn't give it quite enough room. He's going to have to be a little more patient. Let's see if he'll do it on the outside. I would doubt that coming out of turn number nine. Busby moves over, sees him in the mirrors, and lets Morton by. Thank you very much. John Morton's starting to get real serious about his racing again. Competed in the opening kart race in the streets of Long Beach. 
Now down at the pit area, out of that Mustang is Bobby Rahal. Brock Yates uh, hopes to get some thoughts from him. Brock? With Bobby Rahal, who ran the first shift in the Mustang, uh, how was she going, Bobby? How was the car reacting? Oh, it was running good. We were uh, taking it easy. We wanted to, you know, we weren't too concerned about leading, but I wanted to stay up, you know, within reach. The car was running fine, then it came through uh, turn nine here, and it started misfiring, and I didn't know what it was. Thought maybe it was fuel. So uh, came in, you know, better to come in than run out. So you you came in a little bit earlier than planned? Yeah, a little bit earlier. Do you think that sets a pattern for the race, or was it something else? I hope not. <laughs> Well, that sounded like a nervous little laugh from Bobby Rahal. A man who is just commanding this race right now is Al Holbert, looking for his first ever race win here at Riverside in that portion. I think a lot of people were feeling that this might be the way this race would turn out with his Porsche starting in third place, kind of steadily moving up, taking command in the middle stages as it's doing right now, and Holbert just driving away from everybody. So his big concern right now, stay out of trouble. This car, trouble, number 98, Toyota Celica, driver Dennis Ossi, car owner Dan Gurney. They've got some fiberglass body damage, and that is a major problem in endurance races of this type. Steve Evans explained earlier. When 5,300 drivers go out for six hours of not-so-friendly motoring, especially at Riverside, some of the uh, pretty fiberglass bits and pieces are bound to get banged up. That's why the majority of the GTP cars have, just behind their pits up against a chain-link fence, here's an entire rear body section that can be snapped on in a matter of a few moments. Heck of a lot quicker than trying to tape one up that's badly damaged. Uh, here's a front end, clean one owner, never been raced direct. Let's see, down here we have another rear end, the uh, fellas from Japan, the Toyota GTP car had this flown in, and their first time here at Riverside, they were t taking no chances. They got a tail and a nose piece for the Toyota. Let's hope none of this has to be installed, but I have a feeling not much of it's gonna be left. <laughs> well, none has been used so far in this automobile. The number 86 Porsche 962 of Al Holbert and Derek Bell as it leads here at Riverside. Stay with us, we'll be back. Back at Riverside, I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates and Ed Bruce. Al Holbert has relinquished the lead in the 86 Porsche for a scheduled driver change. Derek Bell, defending champion of this race, is already strapped into the car. They're putting on some fresh rubber fuel and will go out to try to again catch the Ford car, number seven with Klaus Ludwig, who has inherited the lead. Well, the pits are getting pretty busy right now, Steve. A whole lot of automobiles stopping, including this car. Kemper Miller now riding in second place. Jack stands are up on that automobile. These cars carry hydraulic jacks internally, so all you got to do is stick an air hose on the side of them, off the ground to change the tires. De Navarez, his co-driver, is going to take over for that second shift. So the Ford Mustang now regains the lead with Klaus Ludwig aboard, and he is really motoring Brock, trying to put as much distance between himself and that pitted Porsche as he possibly can. Sure is. This is an opportunity to really open up the distance because uh, they've fallen back to third place with that Bell uh, Holbert car, the Porsche, and that is going to be costly for them. Of course, as we see Derek Bell come out of the pits, hammer down, he's going to try to make up that distance on... Uh, both uh, Randy Lanier, who now rides in second place, and also the leader, Klaus Ludwig. So uh, we know that this car, that number 86 Porsche, has plenty of speed. We saw it lead the race earlier, and there's little question that they can do it again. This 962 Porsche is a replica of the 956 that ran in Europe last year, dominated it, but now conforms to the IMSA specs. It has uh, only one turbo instead of two, and the driver is in a safer position. His feet are behind the front wheels, as opposed to the European rules, which permit him to be up front. A safer car, it conforms to the IMSA rules, Steve. And even though we say this is the debut of a brand new car, most of the components on this automobile have been race proven, uh, and especially at Daytona this year when Mario Andretti led the race in the prototype. Coming out of the pits now is the Colombian driver, Mauricio De Narvarez, who won the Sebring race in a vintage old Porsche. Brock Yates is now down in the Porsche pits. I'm with Al Holbert, who uh, relieved, uh, was relieved by Derek Bell while he had the 962 in the lead. Al, uh, was any kind of a pattern established out there in the first hour of the race that you felt uh, could be important as you go along? Well, of course, uh, I found out how quickly we can run without hurting the car, and we, <clears throat> at all times, were being pretty careful. Uh, 
I, I was a little surprised that the Chevrolet March didn't come up, but I have a feeling that Bill Whittington's not driving it yet. And uh, at least we know what we can do. We have a good readout on fuel economy, so what we can do there, tire wear. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to get it all tested beforehand, so we're sort of learning as we go. But basically, it was a very satisfactory start for you. Oh, yeah, the cars, you know, I followed uh, Bobby for a little bit, and I just wanted to see, and it just, I felt he was holding me up at, at the pace he decided to run, so I thought, I, you know, it's always risky following a guy, so I just thought I'll see if I can lead without extending the car, and that worked out fine. Well, now it's the Ford that is leading, and apparently without extending the car. Klaus Ludwig in the Mustang GTP car, number seven, leads this Los Angeles Grand Prix. It sounded, Brock, as if Holbert plans to be more concerned about that march when Bill Whittington gets aboard. I'm sure that's the case. Whittington is known to be an absolutely flat-out race driver. He gets uh, with the program whenever he's in the automobile. That was Whittington we just saw on the wall. Let's see if he does indeed get into the march as Randy Lanier brings the second place car, the Chevrolet March, into the pit area. Randy, who is in the water sports equipment business down in Florida, races part-time, uh, a gentleman sports car racer, and he is not getting out of the car. They are taking on fuel and whatever else they need, but Randy Lanier is staying in the car. When we saw Whittington, you notice that he is the one on the radio running this team. He said, Randy, you're doing fine. Stay right where you are. Let's not take the time now to change drivers. All these cars carry just a little over 31 gallons of fuel. That's 120 liters if you're into the metric system. So that's not a whole lot of fuel. So they don't have much uh, in the way of range. So they'll stop a lot. Lanier will be back in. I'm sure Whittington will be in the car shortly. In the meantime, let's go to Ed Bruce in the garage area. Thank you, Brock. This is Roger Bailey, who is the technical director for the International Motorsports Association. And, and while, even while we're talking, Roger is working the earphones, keeping, uh, keeping tabs on what's going on. Right. Roger, what does the technical director do? Well, basically, I'm full-time with him, sir. And during office hours, I, at the end of the season, we write the rules for the following year's participation, events, cars, uh, and answer technical inquiries. Are there many rules changes from year to year? We try not to. We try and uh, keep them as stable as possible so that people can build a car knowing that it will be good for a three or four year span. Obviously, as technology increases, uh, racing does change, but we try and keep our changes to a minimum. That way, we try and get larger fields. Um, when a car is for the original owner, becomes obsolete, we hope we can sell it down the line to a beginner and try and keep them all as competitive as we can for as long as we possibly can. Safety is a prime motivating factor in your job, is it not? I think safety is probably the prime factor. Uh, performance is secondary. I don't think the people in the stands there with a car doing 140 miles an hour or 160 miles an hour, providing it's safe, that's our main concern. The performance angle comes later. Thanks, Ed Bruce and Roger Bailey. As we see the march, uh, number two of Al Leon getting underway. Steve is with the man who just climbed out of that car, Hurley Haywood. So Al Leon has gone into car number two for Hurley Haywood. Hurley, you came in early with some steering adjustments. Yeah, the rack, uh, the steering rack had turned and there was a bolt and it wouldn't let the uh, car turn all the way to the right. So I had to come in and stop and they fixed it. We lost two laps and we... We got one of them back, but the, the track is very slippery. The heat is making the track very slippery, so it's up. You gotta be very careful out there. And apparently some pretty good degrees in the car. Looking at uh, your brow here. Excuse me? Apparently very warm in the car as well. Looking at your brow here. No, it's not too bad. It's fairly good in the car, but it's just, uh, it's slippery out there and you have to work hard. Any particular place that's uh, tricky? Everywhere. So suddenly there's a change in the leadership situation here at Riverside as the number seven Mustang, driven by Klaus Ludwig, comes into the pits. This is definitely an unscheduled stop. We see fuel being put into the car. That's a routine that always happens at a pit stop, no matter whether it's scheduled or not. The car's up on its jack stands, and people are beginning to swarm over the suspension. The door is now open, and there is problems in the pits of the Mustang. And trying to take advantage of that opportunity is Derek Bell in the Porsche, car number 86. Bell regains the lead across the start-finish line. So, and coming together is John Morton and number 18. The 18 suffers spins right in front of Derek Bell. Brock remarked earlier that that Porsche had the biggest brakes he's ever seen. Well, Derek Bell used every square inch of them. So Bell collects his thoughts, drives around the Sauber, and has the lead as the Mustang is in the pit area. 
And Fumfar, the driver of that number 18 BMW Sauber, saved himself from some serious problems. He uh, did a 360 and got it back under control. Eric Bell definitely had a moment there because he said, oh boy, I am going to collect this guy unless he gets out of my way. And now the hood is up on the Mustang and they are looking hard. It appears as part of that very complex turbocharger system. This automobile has uh, an extremely complex turbocharger, Steve, and that appears to be the source of the problem. As we see, the 962 Porsche driven by Derek Bell, clear of that problem and on his way. Let's look at it again, Brock. You see, just regaining the lead across the line is Derek Bell, car number 86, the third car in the picture. Suddenly, car number 18 slides right into John Morton. Morton never saw him coming. On the brakes, the car spins, and Bell would have just T-boned this automobile had he not been so alert. On the brakes, slows down probably 25 to 30 miles an hour, still wondering which way to go. The Sauber 18 suddenly straightened out, and Bell drives around him very calmly, coolly. You can see why Derek Bell is in such great demand as an endurance driver. Incredibly collected individual. So what could have been disastrous for Derek Bell and team proves to be just a minor little irritant as Bell is comfortably in the lead. Down in the pit area with the ailing Mustang and Klaus Ludwig is Brock. Well, that's exactly what's the problem. Boost, uh, boost went down. Uh -huh. You think it can be fixed? I hope. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Klaus Ludwig reports that the lost boost, so that could be some turbocharger problems, but... Uh, there comes off, comes uh, the entire nose of the automobile, so this is going to be a longer stop than they had hoped for, obviously. It's, uh, they came into the pits with a 20-second lead, but that has long since disappeared. So Derek Bell now leads, and this man, Randy Lanier from Florida, in the March number 56, is in the second spot. We'll be back to Riverside to see if the Ford can get back in the race. Back for more IMSA-style endurance racing at the Riverside International Raceway in Riverside, California, as we see the Lola Mazda in for a driver change and a routine pit stop. Team owner and chief Jim Busby out of the car, Ron Grable into the automobile, getting underway. How are things going down there, Steve Evans? Losing fire as Grable trying to get the car bump started. Jim Busby looking on, trying to keep the car alive. Oh. So an anxious moment for a tired driver, Jim Busby, he gets out, only to watch his car try to stall. Any words of wisdom for Ron? <laughs> watch out for the turkeys. I have never seen so many bad drivers on one racetrack in one day in all my life. A lot of drivers are complaining also, Jim, that the track is uh, pretty slick. We're getting that way. A little bit greasy, but what makes it worse is you got to get out of the line for these guys who don't have any business being out there. You wind up in the marbles. Good advice for Jim Busby's relief driver, Ron Grable, as he currently rides in the 16th place. Let's take a look at the leaders here at Riverside as Derek Bell holds the lead in the GTP overall division. First place overall in this race. Leading in GTO, Walt Warren in the number 47 Corvette. And also leading in the GTU category, Elliot Forbes Robinson in the Porsche 944 number 87. A very competitive event three distinct classes, Steve Evans, so everybody is sort of racing for different kinds of prizes here. And that's part of the problem Jim Busby was talking about. Some of those slower cars, the closing rate is so fast that uh, if they're not constantly watching their mirrors, you could get in trouble. Here is the number two car, number 56, coming into the pit area again, and this time there will be a driver change. The very aggressive Bill Whittington just rips car owner Randy Lanier out of the car. Whittington going to work on the belts, getting the car set up for himself. And in the meantime, this automobile, the Porsche 962, maintains a commanding lead as Bill Weddington scrambles into that automobile. Uh, fuel going on board. As I said earlier, just a little over 31 gallons into these automobiles, so they don't go too far. But in the meantime, good fuel mileage and extreme reliability from the Porsche 962. Some tire changes being made, some chassis changes being made, and finally they encapsule Bill Whittington into that number 56 March Chevrolet and he should be back on the racetrack pretty quickly but he's going to have to hurry because the distance is opening as Derek Bell keeps on trucking. 
Whittington is, a, as we said, a very aggressive driver, but he's also a very smooth driver. He and his brother won at Le Mans a few years back, and that takes 24 hours of very smooth and very reliable driving. Let's go to Steve Evans with Randon in there, who just climbed out of that number 56 car. Boy, the crew executing a very nice pit stop while you were busy strapping in Bill Whittington. Well done. Thank you very much. How's the car feel to you now? You're running very high second, I believe. Well, the car's running real good right now. We're, we're shifting a little early, long way before the end of the race. That 962 Porsche running up uh, to everybody's expectations right now. Yeah, it looks about that way. If we're still there at the end, we might have a chance. Well, if this man in the car, number 56, March has anything to say about it, they will, because he is going to stand on the gas. You can count on that. He races airplanes when he's not racing cars, and he goes even faster in those, Steve. And we got a problem here for car number 47. It was leading the GTO class. Steve Millen took over from Walt Boren, and in the early laps with Millen behind the wheel, they already have a problem and are off to the side of the track. Millen out of the car. And the same thing goes for number 67. Ron Grable, who just took over for Jim Busby, he is alongside the racetrack as well. Oh, that's a tough break. It's appears that there was no, nothing, no body damage. He must have had some kind of mechanical problems. And now the leader into the pits. Looks like a routine stop. Only four men over allowed over the wall in IMSA, by the way, Steve. That is less than a NASCAR, and then that, in some cases, accounts for the slower pit stops. You just don't have as much manpower out there to help you. Well, this pit stop was orchestrated well enough that uh, Derek Bell came in the leader. Al Holbert will go out, car number 86, will still be the leader with Bill Whittington in second. You don't think it's hard work driving one of these endurance cars? Well, think again. Look at Englishman Derek Bell. He is exhausted. We'll be back with more from Riverside. Back at Riverside, California, for more IMSA-style endurance action with Al Holbert holding the lead over a charging Bill Whittington. The Miller de Navarez march a number of laps down in third place. Steve Evans is in the pits to talk with relieved driver Derek Bell. Derek Bell, now that he's been debriefed by the Bruce Eleven crew, can talk to us. What a nice Sunday afternoon drive. Yes, it, was, uh, it wasn't without effort, though. <laughs> What's going on out there? It's pretty busy. Um, there was a one guy, here's another guy right in front of me on the bridge here, and spun right in front of me and nearly took me out uh, when I was overtaking him and the other fellow. There's quite a, quite a bit of entertainment out there. There's people spinning off like tops. <laughs> How hard are you running the car? Can you divulge it's that? Pretty hard, but the um, because we have a bit of a bit of an advantage. Obviously, we're not running absolutely flat out, but you know we're pushing the car pretty hard. But we're we're con we're um, containing you know the boost and keeping it down. So we're not, we got some in, in spare if we need it. So Derek Bell, very confident at this point, as his sort of teammate, kind of informally at least, comes into the pit right next to him. This is the Elliott Forbes Robinson John Schneider Porsche 944, also based out of the same Seattle garage as the Bruce Levin owned Porsche 962. Dallas businessman John Schneider, who bought this car from Levin after he won the championship last year, is out of the car and now helping EFR buckle up. They have a good lead in the GTU category. Roger Mandeville has now moved the Mazda into the lead in the GTO category after we saw Millen go out with the Corvette. Roger Mandeville now lives down in the deep south, originally from Canada. So much of this IMSA activity comes out of the southern states. Right now, let's join Ed Bruce down in the garage area again. Thanks, Steve. I'm in the garage area with John Cooper. John is the past president of the International Motor Speedway in Indianapolis and the current president of the Automobile Competition Committee for the United States. John, what is ACUS? ACUS, Ed, is the uh, confederation of IMSA, NASCAR, USAC, SCCA, and NHRA, the five uh, major sanctioning bodies in the United States. Delegates to the FIA, which is the international sanctioning body, is that not right? Right. The FIA, uh, based in Paris, grants to each country the sporting authority, as they call it, for motorsports. And in this country, that's granted to ACUS, which in turn subs it out to the five clubs. John, how does this racing relate to European style of racing now? Well, I think really IMSA GT racing more than any other form of racing in the United States does relate to the kind of racing they have in Europe. And as a matter of fact, the European regulations for GT racing have uh, just been brought in line with the IMSA regulations. So it looks like we're going to have one world of racing for GT cars. John Cooper, one of the most capable executives in motorsports anywhere in the world. Earlier, we heard the IMSA president, John Bishop, Brock, talk about this car, the Turbo Buick. 
We're going to hear a lot more about Turbo Buicks in the years to come, Steve, as Detroit shifts away from the V8s into the V6 engines of this type. This turbocharged engine in here it puts out a lot of power. It's very competitive. Unfortunately, they've got some problems with it right now. Here's the more traditional power plant, the old V8, a Bill Weddington's car running like a freight train. We've seen V8 Chevys run all over the world in all kinds of competition. Well, after 30 years, uh, it's about time they figured it out, wouldn't you say? <laughs> the V8 is certainly the engine of choice in so many forms of motor racing, not only in this country, but a lot of them have been exported overseas as well. Whittington is running a good deal, put their lap times, and was Randy Lanier, hoping to catch the leader, this Porsche, number 86, with Al Holbert back at the wheel. Holbert out there, you heard Derek Bell say that they are running almost a capacity, but if they have to, they can turn the boost up just a little bit higher. Al Holbert, however, right now comfortably running in that lead spot. I'm sure they're showing him a pit board that Bill Whittington is picking him up a little bit. Well, they've got a problem as well, Steve, because the more boost you use, the more fuel you use. And uh, pit stops are critical here. We've seen that pit stops can be very slow in this kind of racing. And if you lose some time in the pits, ooh, there's that number 18 car that almost put uh, Derek Bell out a little earlier with that big spin down the front straightaway. And uh, now Al Holbert's saying, oh, boy, I want to get clear of him. Well, he doesn't play favorites, does he, when it comes to blockading the Porsche car? <laughs> Of course, that thing's fired by a BMW engine, so who's to know? But anyway, as uh, Al Holbert gets clear of that number 18 Sauber, we'll be back. I'm Brock Gates, along with Steve Evans and Ed Bruce, with more endurance racing action from Riverside, California. And Steve, there's been a change in the lead. While we were away, Brock, there was a driver change at car number 86, the Porsche. Derek Bell is back in in place of Al Holbert and has fallen back to second position. Bill Whittington in the Chevy March is leading this Grand Prix race here at Riverside. No changes at all at GTO, GTU. The real race now is Bill Whittington with Chevrolet power up against the state-of-the-art, debuting here at Riverside, the 962 Porsche. The fans have got to be going wild over this going to be a race between these two automobiles and these two cars only. The number three car, the Miller de Navarez automobile, is way back. So it's going to be a fight between these two unless, of course, there's some mechanical problems. And so far, Steve, both cars have been running perfectly. We're looking at Whittington here, Brock, but uh, if you'd like to put one of those 962 Porsches in the garage, they're only about a quarter of a million dollars. And uh, with your good credit, I'm sure it'd be no problem. Oh, no problem. Uh, 600 easy payments, and it's mine. <laughs> you work, you right. <laughs> but uh, these, uh, these cars are actually uh, pretty reliable, and they don't break a whole lot. And what you may uh, pay in the top end, you save over a long racing season. A lot of guys say they are really fairly economical to, to run. Of course, uh, you've got to convince your internal revenue agent of that as well. <laughs> Well, Bruce Levin, the man who indeed owns this car from Seattle, Washington, uh, has long fielded Porsches. In fact, uh, won the title last year in the GTU category. And uh, his old car is out there leading again. But look at Whittington. He is taking no prisoners here, trying to stay as far ahead of that Porsche as is humanly possible. As Brock said earlier, the Whittingtons have been involved in air racing. In fact, they just live to race. Bill Whittington here has been involved in the last four Indianapolis 500 races uh, and uh, had a painful crash there a couple of years ago. His leg has finally uh, healed up well enough to where it doesn't give him any trouble. And Whittington right now has a lead over the Porsche, but the Porsche is closing. A little traffic now separating Whittington and Derek Bell. Brock Yates is down in the pits with the owner of that Porsche, Bruce Levin from Seattle. Well, you know, I've known Bruce Levin for a long time. He seldom ever looks tense. This is about as tense as I've ever seen him look. His car is sitting about six, six and a half seconds back in kind of a holding pattern right now. Do you, what do you think? Well, they don't have to make a pit stop, but we do, so it's going to be tight. Is Derek, Derek Bell's in the car? Has he got the boost? Uh, how far has he got the wick turned up right now, do you reckon? Oh, staying stand right normal, but uh, we can always turn up later. <laughs> So that's why you're still smiling, huh? Well, there's a lot, there's a little more in the car, I think so. So you're gonna, you just reckon you're gonna sit there for a while. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna leave it where it's at now, and then go, and then hope for a yellow flag and then gas it up, turn the boost up, go for it. That's all. All right. Okay. Good luck. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Tom. Well, guys, I think that Derek Bell has turned the boost up on his own driving as he is picking up Whittington inch by inch. You see the Porsche getting around a lap car, moving up only about three and a half seconds now between the Chevy March in the lead with Bill Whittington and Derek Bell of England in the Porsche 962. This is some kind of a car race. 
Unfortunately, in a lot of long endurance races, at this point, a car might have the lead by 10 minutes, not just a few seconds as we see right now. Well, this could be it right now because there's a slower car, and Whittington got a little wide trying to get past that slower automobile, and look at this. Bell is ducked underneath him, and he took him coming off of that tight turn six, and it may have been that that slower automobile had some influence on it, and uh, it, it may not be over yet, but boy, he really reeled him in, Steve. Derek Bell now has the lead. So the tables have been turned. It's the Porsche out front, and Whittington hoping for Bell to make a mistake, and he almost does. Gets the rear end of the car out a little too far towards the dirt, recovers very quickly. Derek Bell has put on a masterful driving performance today, as has his teammate Al Holbert. The turbo flicks a little fire at Bill Whittington as he tries to come around. These two are really going for it. They sure are as they go out onto that long 4,000 foot back straight away at Riverside. We'll see what kind of power that Chevy has as Randy Lanier, the co-driver with Bill Whittington, is listening to Whittington on the radio. You've got to wonder what he's saying right now. Oh, I would give anything to patch into that conversation, Brock. <laughs> I'll bet that's a good one. As Derek Bell comes off the corner, turn nine, and now he's diving into the pits. Steve, this will be his final stop. You know, seldom Brocker endurance races won or lost in the pits, but this may be the exception. The windshield being clean, fuel going in, and Derek Bell is coming out of the automobile. That is a surprise, Brock. As close as those car together, do you dare take the time to change drivers? Absolutely, Steve. This is a complete surprise. Derek Bell gets out of the car unannounced. Bill Whittington opens the gap in first place. Derek looks around for Al Holbert, who wasn't ready. Holbert gets his helmet on. Notice he hasn't even got his gloves in his hand. And there's the near pit. Well, they think right now they may have won this race. Holbert taking a long time to get in the car. As you said, Rocky did not have his helmet, his gloves. He thought Bell was staying in the car. A tragic miscue in the Porsche pits. Indeed it was, and a very surprising one. These guys are usually very, very buttoned up as Al Holbert tries to grapple with his shoulder harness and get the uh, 962 started and back into the race. Now, there's a very good chance, almost a certainty, that Randy Lanier is going to have to bring Whittington in for at least fuel. You can bet they won't change drivers. You can bet on that as Al Holbert gets underway to try to run down Bill Whittington, speeding out of the Riverside pits, getting up to speed as quickly as possible to try to run down, and a very, very disappointed Bruce Levin. And you can bet that out on the course, Woodington was checking off the seconds himself as to when he would again see that Porsche. And he's got to be smiling behind the helmet in car number 56. He has got a big, big lead. Will that Chevrolet car have to pit? If so, when? We'll find out when we come back. It's a game of catch-up here at Riverside for this car, the Porsche 962 of Al Holbert. Suddenly and surprisingly in second place after running down Bill Weddington, taking the lead and appearing to be headed for victory, and then a disastrous pit stop and suddenly back in second place, giving up the lead to Bill Weddington in the march. Roger Mandeville has a big lead with the Mazda RX-7 in the GTO category. In GTU, Elliott Forbes Robinson, a commanding lead with the little Porsche 924 Turbo. So we're going to concentrate on this man, Bill Whittington, leading the GTP class. Now, a fair distance behind him is the Porsche and Al Holbert, but remember, Whittington will no doubt have to stop for fuel. Down in the pits is Brock Yates with Derek Bell to get an explanation of that chaotic pit stop. So uh, they just weren't ready for you, but uh, the, uh, the radio is not working in the automobile? I was talking to them, but I don't know if they heard me. Yeah. They were ready with the fuel, but they just weren't ready. I wasn't ready to go well, out. Well, actually, you didn't lose any time. The fuel took almost exactly the same amount of time. So, really, I don't think you lost a bit. Yeah. No, I mean, you're just one of those things. But they, you've always got to be ready. The spare driver must always be there, you know. Exactly. Well, uh, it was about a minute to put the fuel on, so I don't think... What do you think? Do you think you can catch, uh, catch him up? I really don't know. I've almost lost interest. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks anyway. Okay. Well, this fella hasn't lost interest. Bill Whittington coming out of turn number nine. The Chevy March car number 56 leading the Porsche. Whittington down low coming out of nine. In fact, Whittington is going into the pit area. This will be the final stop for the Chevy March. And all they have to do now is take on enough fuel to finish this race. The crew prepared their radio functioning just fine. Suddenly, there's some attention to the left front tire, and that's a bit of a surprise. For every second Whittington spins in the pits, Al Holbert makes up badly needed ground. Now, this car has been in the pits really too long to have just taken on fuel. They have got some kind of a problem. The crew frantically working at the rear of the car, and 
passing through traffic is Al Holbert. They cannot get the air hose off the rear jack. It is apparently stuck to the car, and Holbert continues to make up ground. Holbert was in the pits a little over a minute. This car is approaching 45 seconds, has still not left the pits. See the hose attached to the rear of the car? It will not come off. Finally, they release pressure back at the air bottles, hoping that that will work. Holbert continues to march on. Whittington has the lead, but he has seen a great deal of it evaporate. Out of the pits goes Bill Whittington. The Chevrolet-powered march, hoping to stay in front of Al Holbert, and he will do that, but not by much, Brock Yates. Absolutely, Steve. The brakes kind of evened out in those pit stops. Both of them had problems, although I think the margin probably went to Whittington. I think he might have gained maybe five seconds in terms of disaster between the two of them. It definitely shortened up the cushion that he had. An exhausted Randy Lanier. What apparently happened there was they had counted on only putting in fuel. Whittington is motioning, or was motioning, to the left front tire. The car was pushing, and he wanted it changed. That's what caused that whole debacle with the air hoses and the air jacks. They weren't prepared to do that. They only had fuel ready. And here, picking up Bill Whittington a little bit at a time is Al Holbert in the Porsche. And now, of course, slower traffic becomes a factor for both of these cars. If one, just one ball in front of anybody, and they can, it can be a whole new race. All Whittington has to do is get blocked for a few turns, and suddenly, Colbert's going to be on him. And there are a lot of slow cars out on the racetrack. There's no pacing these automobiles now. There is no strategy. This is a race to the flag, a brand new ball game. Both cars full of fuel. Both cars have relatively fresh tires, and both cars Whoa, have fresh drivers. Whittington in trouble, almost spins the car. Can Holbert get around him here? Holbert is apparently slowed up by that traffic you talked about, Brock. What a break for Whittington. Sailed into turn eight, just too hot, and got it down on the inside. Fortunately, Randy Lanier doesn't know about that. He's probably having heart failure right now. Bruce Levin and his crew ruminating over the problems that they had trying to figure out what went wrong as Bill Whittington gets back to speed and still holds the lead. But boy, that was a close call. Now, through turn nine, on the outside of a slower automobile, you can see that Bill Whittington has not taken anything out of the way he's driving. He's got it on the metal and driving as hard as he can. Well, uh, seeing him that sideways, Brock, uh, that says everything. Whittington is just pushing that car and himself to the limit. He has to because only a few seconds behind him is Al Holbert in that 962. And we talked earlier about the adjustment that they have to that turbocharger boost in that cockpit. Can you imagine where that knob is now? It has probably been twisted right off flush with the dashboard. Al Holbert chasing this man, Bill Whittington, in the closing laps of the Los Angeles Grand Prix. It was a Whittington brother, Don, who won the last race. Look at Lanier's crew. Lanier is trying to drive that car, even though he's standing on the pit wall. <laughs> and there's your interval, Steve. Less than five seconds between these two automobiles. An incredible race, and it could go right down to the wire. We could have a photo finish here. It will go right down to the wire, Brock. This is absolutely the best finish in any endurance contest I've ever had the privilege of watching. As Bill Whittington on the last lap, Whittington's car bobbles a little bit, Brock, in that very same spot. Boy, he's going to remember turn eight no matter what when this thing is over. As Whittington ducks in behind that red 935 coming right at you, that is the fastest car down this straightaway, remember? And Whittington's going to draft him to get an extra few feet as this car, Al Hobart, chases him. Now, at the end of the straightaway, Whittington ducks underneath Aiken and goes down into turn nine, the last corner on this last final few feet of this race. Bill Whittington heading toward the checkered flag. One bobble and he can lose it, Steve. Bill Whittington has driven the thinking man's car race today, and it pays off with the checkered flag. Bill Whittington from Florida, the crew going absolutely nuts. Randy Lanier and his team, who have worked so very, very hard, getting their just reward right now. The Porsche of Al Holbert finishes just seconds behind. We'll be back here at Riverside to talk with Bill Whittington right after this. Here in Riverside, California, Bill Whittington, who co-drove with car owner Randy Lanier, has the privilege of bringing their Chevrolet march into the winner's circle. Brock Yates is down there. Oh, here they come. Bill Whittington, Randy Lanier. Couldn't have made it any closer than that. <laughs> Fantastic. Randy, let me get you first. 
kind of tense at the end, huh? Oh, don't touch. <laughs> it was like waiting for a baby. <laughs> Did you know he spun a uh, couple of laps? Yeah, well, we, we figured that out when he turned a 41 on his lap chart, <laughs> so we figured something went wrong. You Most didn't... exciting race for a six-hour race I've ever seen. You guys made it tense. You know, you had, uh, you, had the, uh, you had the jack hang up on the last pit stop. Yeah, that well, made a little tense. the ground was a little uneven. When it came up, the car wouldn't get, come up right, so we couldn't get the tire off. <laughs> so that, Well, they had a little slower stop than you did, so uh, you, uh, you broke yeah, even we on that Yeah, we was about 20 seconds faster on our last stop. Congratulations, super race, Thank Randy. You. Great race. It was indeed a great race. In the GTO division, Roger Mandeville and Amos Johnson take the winner's share of the purse with their Mazda RX-7. In GTU, how about a wire-to-wire -wire victory for the 924 Porsche driven by Elliott Forbes Robinson and car owner John Schneider. Let's go back again to Victory Lane and Brock Yates with Bill Whittington. Hey, man. Super. You made it exciting, huh? Well, I tell you, <laughs> I just didn't know if I was going to be able to stay in front of him or not. It got real, it got pushed, loose, push, loose, hit some oil, spun out in front Is of him. Is that what that was? Oil yeah. out there? Yeah. The car, he was just running you down. You knew he had full boost on all the way, but he had a slow stop, you know. And uh, we, had a, we had a pretty slow stop. We got a left front tire that we got stuck on there, but uh, we were pretty fortunate, really. Everything went, you know, how could you do any better? But uh, we had a pretty much of a push problem all day, and we just were, you know, trying to change push back and forth when it was when it was hooked up it was great but you know what can you say car was running super strong all weekend though super job great job bill thank you congratulations to that team their average speed a new record for the race 110.45 miles an hour they won it by a little over four seconds and this trophy will find a treasured place in one of their trophy rooms and so ends one of the most exciting endurance races in recent history and let's hear it for the IMSA GTP cars. Not only are they extremely reliable and unique, but they're exciting to watch, and boy, are they fast. Let's go to Ed Bruce for some closing thoughts. They are fast. In endurance racing, though, it's not always the fastest car, but the team that's best prepared. Congratulations to all the teams that competed today, and congratulations to the winners. From Riverside, California, for Brock Yates and Steve Evans, the racing experts, I'm Ed Bruce. Have a good day.